uh, special thanks again to Astrid. Uh, thank you to the Open Justice team who helped me flesh things out. Um, this talk will be a bit dense uh, because I had a lot of the material to go on, uh, but it's all being recorded, so I thought I might as well go all in. So open uh, digital innovation in the public sector, what works? Let's begin. Uh, first off, I'm uh, Peter Amontens. I'm a software developer with a, a law degree. I've been building digital services for uh, over 15 years uh, as a civil servant, as a digital startup, a data engineer, a freelancer, and currently as a contractor for uh, the Direction Interministérielle du Numérique uh, in Paris. In my free time, I also built uh, digital services uh, for the, the public interest, um, a Belgian unofficial journal that has 15,000 visits a month. I founded a nonprofit working on digital transformation of justice. And in writings, I try to shine a light on what the peculiarities uh, of innovation by and for the public sector imply. Uh, but beyond that uh, moderate obsession uh, of digital innovation, uh, I think I'm just mostly a regular person. Um, before we start, uh, I wanted to explain what I understand and mean uh, about the topic of today. Um, there will be some startup like uh, jargon like agility and lean. Uh, I had to use those words because otherwise I had to define them all over again. But just know that when I use them, I mean them in their like most purest and original sense. And uh, should you have questions about them, we can always clear things up uh, later on. Uh, so, so what do I mean by, by open? Um, well, there's the values of transparency and collaboration, tools, practices you may know of uh, open data, open access, open source, and whatnot, uh, documented APIs. Um, there are a lot of benefits uh, working in open source, but it's also more than that, uh, particularly in the regard to, to the public sector. Um, there's the, the Article 15 of the Declaration of Rights of Man and of the Citizen. So I'm a Jewish, so I like that kind of stuff. Uh, it's uh, from the French uh, Revolution still, but it still has um, constitutional value in France. And Article 15 states that society has the right to ask a public official for accounting of his administration. And transposed to uh, software, uh, that means that uh, software written by and for the states means the source code has to be accessible, it has to be open. So there's a lot of meaning behind the open uh, word. Um, public sector, well, public sector is not the private sector, but the public sector has a couple of core values that make it really specific. Um, there's a value of continuity, so there must be no interruption in the service you provide. Equality, uh, the service must be for everyone. You cannot choose the public you you you, you target, and um, utility, which is adaptability, which means that uh, a service from the public sector has to adapt and can stand still uh, in in regard to technological change. Uh, it has to be state of the art. Uh, that's the definition of it. Well. Private sector can use those values too, but then it's the choice, it's not imposed. Um, and these values mean uh, a public sector can be merely analyzed uh, or built with the usual concepts and constraints of, of a commercial service, for example. Uh, you, you, of course, understand that I'm a, I'm a staunch defender of letting the public sector innovate from the inside, but uh, that's another matter. Um, Innovation. Innovation is anything that can that's new, be it a technology, an approach, a way of doing things. It's uh, something precious uh, because it, it makes things more efficient. Um, it makes people's lives better. Uh, but it's also something very fragile um, that can easily be lost and destroyed, ignored. And that's why it needs its own space and time. But I'll come back to, to the aspect of innovation uh, later on. Um, and digital culture, well, that's that's the use of, uh, I see it as a particular context, context of uh, working digitally uh, with virtual tools, services, data. Uh, for example, there's, um, there's the scale and speed of diffusion of a public service, for example. Um, if you can like serve 10 people, you can easily serve 100 times more with almost no additional cost. Uh, and each one of those 10,000 people can personalize their service to their own needs, tailored to their own uh, wants. And suddenly, those 100,000 people start expecting more of you and your service. And if you're not careful, uh, tomorrow, those 1 million people might sue you because you uh, leaked their personal data by accident. Though there's a lot of unique challenges within the digital realm, uh, but it's also filled to the brim with potential. Uh, and if you have the right tools and practices to make use of it. Um, 
so the digital world is, is, is a whole new one. Uh, you can't just expect to carbon and copy old paper services and written protocols to the digital realm and expect it, uh, expect it to be sufficient. Uh, I, I, I think there are, and a lot of people think, because uh, it's uh, quite a hot topic for the moment, there are a lot of digital native ways of doing things that are more appropriate than practices and customs that can be traced back uh, to the industrial revolution. So this part will be in three parts. This talk will be in three parts. Uh, innovation by chance in the Belgian public sector, uh, innovation by design in the French public sector, and open and digital culture applied to uh, a, public, a public policy problem. And as a disclaimer, what I express, it's only my point of view. And at no point uh, I blame any individual or groups of individuals because they themselves can only act within the bound uh, of a system or process and can't necessarily uh, act outside of it. So um, innovation by chance in the public sector. Um, by chance, I mean, uh, there's not really a, a planning to, 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 to make, to build innovation. Uh, it's an outcome, but it's not the desired result. It's like ordering a new service uh, from a menu, but without necessarily, necessarily realizing the scope of your ambition, uh, the needs and obstacles you might face. Um, and as subject, uh, I'll be talking about a digital proceedings platform for the Council of State, uh, which I've built. Uh, it's a unique service, not because I built it, because it's unique in both its, its breadth and in its complexity. Uh, I've heard in the years since about others, uh, other digital proceedings platforms in Europe, um, but none of it come anywhere close, and the service has been live for over seven years. First, a, a little a little introduction about what the Council of State is. I'll, I'll, I'll be, go right, right fast over it, and here is the view of the backyard of the Council of State, for example. Um, but Council of State has two main sections, administrative litigation and legislation. Uh, if you want to dispute the construction of a wind farm or a school board decision, you go to the left side to administrative litigation. And if you are a lawmaker uh, with a new law or decree, well, the right side uh, will tell you how good or how bad your text really is. And, f and in, in, they call that advisory opinions. Uh, for a couple of years, uh, they have finally been made public. Um, there are, I, I, I can't go into detail of this, uh, of this fascinating institution. Uh, there are other organs that are e equally important, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it has its own practices, uh, its own customs and its own history also. Speaking of history, it has a history of digital services because the Council of States is widely regarded within law circles as the premier institution uh, regarding um, developing new tools. Um, they had their first websites in 96, uh, fully published all of their case law uh, from 94 onward and kept on building new digital services over the years uh, to facilitate access to doctrine, uh, to the opinions, to the arrests. And that has created, um, for any, anyone interested in administrative law, a unique environment in Belgium uh, because nowhere else there's so much in and, easy, and, so, and so easy access to, to, uh, to, the, to the information. And they have a set of tools and, 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 and services that are quite incomparable in our country and perhaps even in Europe, because at one point, uh, the Council of States decided that they needed to provide an electronic proceedings platform. And I, I can't remember, really remember the details, but there wasn't many much study uh, about it. It was just like, okay, we need this. Uh, there's been an ask about it. So let's let's start, let's get things rolling. And it was extremely ambitious for uh, for a, a small institution of, of, of uh, under, under 500 people um, with a small IT service, because we had no particular experience in providing a full uh, two-way digital service. Um, and they have the task to, to uh, a junior developer. We had no particular guidance or expertise in the matter. Um, but still, some things the council did really well. It set up uh, user groups so we could uh, see each other uh, multiple times in uh, a kind of development period. Um, we used uh, iterative development cycles. So we started really fast. After three months, we had our first working prototype, which the users then used uh, forward. And we, we, we went back to it and we iterated on it. And I think I, I, think I rewrote every part uh, at least twice um, at the end. 
and I, I also had a lot of freedom as developer to contact users externally, internally. Um, and there was also no preconception about what the service would be in the end. We concentrated really on building functional software, uh, working software. And once the software, the service was ready, we sat down and wrote the rules and the concepts of the service that would be uh, for the users to, to, uh, to apply. And the rulings also. Um, Okay, that's good. Um, and we released it in 2014. We released the service uh, free and for everyone with multiple interfaces, electronic ID identification, electronic signature, etc. And uh, the animation you see on your screen is uh, the back office, in fact, uh, which uh, regular citizens uh, shouldn't see, uh, can't, can't see, it's an internal tool, um, but it's uh, specifically built for the registrar who, is, who has the mission to um, handle incoming and outgoing documents. Uh, and it was built to allow them to manage all the cases because the service was built to allow for two to 4,000 uh, active cases at the same time. And the service was, was a success. Uh, once released, um, and despite the need to continuously improve and adapt the service, usage just kept growing. And during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, usage is even uh, 100%. Uh, every, every case is now fully electronic, and there are over 10,000 active cases uh, on the service at, at the moment. Um, there are some chaotic stories during development uh, because uh, the council wasn't really prepared to provide to provide such a vast and evolving service to provide the support. Uh, I remember at one time I was on phone uh, support, uh, providing support for a Norwegian ambassador, for example, and I had to debug a bug because the, the system might go down. And then suddenly there was someone in my office uh, requesting me to come to his to to uh, to change his uh, twin toner, for example. And but it's, it's much stories like that uh, because we weren't just prepared, we weren't ready uh, to 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 to, uh, to 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 give to to provide such a service. And I think we were very lucky it didn't crash uh, in times like these. And the service kept evolving for four more years after that. And these are three examples on the inside that were built uh, by listening to the needs of the users. Uh, in the center, there you have like the overview of dates. That's uh, from a document because uh, a judge realized internally that uh, he didn't know the status of a case at one point. Uh, so we were, we were in full discovery mode. Uh, we were, okay, we're going electric. What are, what are, what are the lessons you should know about it? Um, and uh, during the audience, uh, we realized that the, the lawyer had just uploaded a new file just before the audience, because that was possible in an electronic uh, proceedings platform. You can't do it in paper, but in electronic, you can. And so we had to work on a new document. Um, I, I, I went to those people and we spoke together. And we said, like, oh, look, what data do you need? And we put together this document. Uh, and first, it was a bit complex to understand. So we added a column with uh, some details uh, around it. And that document became like the missing link between the digital and the material world. And it ended up replacing the very big uh, manila folders uh, from the paper proceedings uh, that moved around the, the Council of State. Uh, that was very interesting. And on the left, there's this dashboard also in the registrar's office because people would phone in and ask, hey, I can't I can't uh, upload the file. Is there a problem with the, with the platform? And instead of forwarding the call to the IT service, we installed small dashboards with health status indicators and uh, new activity on the platform and just could just look up and say, no, everything's all right. Uh, or just, oh, okay, there's been uh, some update. You just have to wait a couple of minutes. So that was all lessons learned during development uh, that helped us going forward. And all lessons learned because uh, the status information would otherwise be hidden to, to, to the people that were responsible to contact the users. Uh, we even had in 2000, 2015, we had a completely interactive um, dashboard uh, tablet to provide uh, digital access to people who came to the Council of State to consult an electronic uh, proceedings file. And in, in the end, what were um, the reproducible approaches uh, we used and that worked really well? Well, there was the user centricity, of course, uh, the collaboration we could have with uh, internal and external, external, external users, the iterative uh, development cycles, uh, we just we started uh, a bit small and then we grew over time, it bigger and bigger and bigger, added new aspects, new modules. Uh, there was a lot of autonomy, a lot of trust placed in, into the development team. And there was a big focus on working software. Um, but these, um, these uh, approaches alone um, 
don't necessarily prepare the, the service to, to remain in good shape for the future because um, security environments, user behaviors kept on evolving. Just just uh, last month, uh, I realized uh, we realized that users uh, uploaded movies, uh, video files on the platform. It was never made for that. But users, uh, people on the internet, are now accustomed to upload video files. And so they're expected, well, uh, why not uh, upload it there? And so while providing the service, you continuously have to uh, work on it. And in the end, it's it's literally, um, and that's a bit of a digression, but it's a state of mind about uh, digital dirt service development. Uh, and you can find that state of mind everywhere. Um, IT developments are, are um, uh, often viewed as, as just as projects, which start at the moment and then they end. And once released, uh, they are mostly abandoned because you did what you had to do. You check the box on your to-do list and you go up to the next project. But that doesn't work for anything beyond a particular scope. Uh, you end up with tools that grow old, uh, technical depth exploded, uh, the users grow dissatisfied in the best of cases. And such developments, in fact, such services must be thought of as products, um, which start but only end when they are put out of circulation. And suddenly you have to consider the whole life cycle of your service, of the evolution and ad adaptation to change. And that's that's how you should build uh, and maintain a digital service uh, provided to the people. Second part, um, I left uh, the Council of States and I went into the innovation sector pr first uh, as um, a private data, big data startup. And then I, I discovered uh, a unique a unique organization that's uh, a state organized startup like incubator. It's called beta.gov.fr. Simply put, BetaGoof is a particular organization within the DINUM, Direction Interministérielle du Numérique, a service of the prime minister. And its goal, its goal is to improve, of course, the life of the citizens, enterprises, public agents, and improve the effectiveness of existing public policies and help build new digital public services or organizations, mostly by tackling complex problems who don't have necessarily a straightforward solution. Because if you have a problem with a straightforward solution, you just write the spec and you post it to the IT service. No, it is, this is for complex solutions which don't have a, a, a solution right there. Um, BetaGoof doesn't work on its own. Uh, most of the time, it works in collaboration with other administrations who wish, wish to work on a particular problem. Uh, and so they detach uh, a person, um, which we call the intrapreneur, so someone who innovates from the inside of an organization. And that person will be coached, assisted, and will be responsible to make a team, to build, make bring a team together and um, in charge of his project and uh, he will be completely free uh, and full autonomy to develop his service. Um, and BetaGoof is, is just next door to Etalab, which uh, some of you may already know. There's a lot of uh, primarity between the, the two the two cells. Um, but before going on, um, I, 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 I removed a lot of uh, digressions like this uh, from the talk. Uh, I really wanted to keep this one because it's, it talks about the nature of, of innovation. Um, like I said, innovation is something that's uh, that's very fragile. Uh, it starts with a rough idea, and in the beginning, it's very easy to destroy it or to, to just plainly disregard it. Um, you have to nurture it and let it grow so it can prove itself. Um, there's a book I can recommend, Loon Shots, about the subject, and there's this little graphic inside the book about the separation between your operational part of your organization and the more creative parts of, of it, um, and how you ha must have an exchange uh, between both. Like, for example, um, if you want to illustrate it, um, if you want to test new things, new approaches, uh, emerging ways, you need like privateers, people who go against the flow. They put things into question and they are eager to test new and emerging practices and technologies. Or they're just very motivated to make a problem go away. But as an organization, which has a certain size and specific mission, you already also need sailors. Uh, who follow orders so you can concentrate on running not only your boat but the whole fleet you need both groups but mixing those groups is dangerous because at worst if you let the privateers run wild they will just bump into the sailors and they will be at each other's throat in no time and at best they will completely ignore each other and nothing will happen but if you separate them completely uh, the privateers won't provide any benefit to the rest of the fleet and any gold or treasure they find uh, would be completely under end up trapped somewhere um, so there's a clear need to have some balance between both. Uh, you have to separate the groups 
uh, but keep them close to each other and let some sailors become privateers let some privateers come back uh, to sailors so there's an exchange of ideas discoveries and treasures and that's that's really the mission of an incubator it provides a space of freedom of discovery and experimentation um, but close to where that uh, discovery and experimentation close to where it's needed so it can be useful and that that's what it's all about it's making new ideas useful so what is this space of freedom and openness um it's a community it's an open uh, of autonomous teams within the incubator very diversified people from all kinds of backgrounds uh, and the space itself of the incubator of the community is completely open and uh, self-organized uh, what you see here on the pictures is uh, one of the weekly rituals. It's called the stand up. It's when every Wednesday, uh, when I was the, now it's the, the Thursday um, in COVID-19 um, and at the distance. Um, so it's it's the moment when all the people, all the teams gather and they share their news. They share uh, they, they share call for call for assistance, call for help. Um, they they talk what what their what their actuality is, um, and. Um, they also talk about future investigations and possible investigation of possible initiatives. And what Betagoof applies is very simple, in fact. It's just plain best practices from the startup sphere. Uh, it's data and impact driven, uh, autonomy, freedom of the teams, agile development cycles. Uh, and I mean like real agility, like in the manifesto, not some other uh, uh, watered down version. Uh, and of course, user centricity. One of the less, one of the core values is that uh, the needs and wants of the users, those so of the citizen, are more important than those of the administration. And in some regards, that's that's the whole revolution in itself regarding to uh, public policy, solving public problem of public policy. And this is this is the life cycle of uh, a public state startup. Um, it starts with a pre-incubation period, uh, a call to innovators, a specific order that's followed by an investigation period. During investigation, um, one of the main objectives is to see if the problem is a good problem, um, if it's a problem worth solving, if it's uh, it's all the qualities of uh, of being uh, applicable because. Um, well, it's, it, should, it should be, first of all, a problem that can be solved by digital means. Uh, so once it can be uh, constructed in small, it can be easily scaled to the, to the whole nation. Um, and once the investigation period is over, you, you go before the launch committee, where it's decided if we effectively start uh, with uh, the construction of, um, of, the, the solution, of a solution. And during the first period, while well, the entrepreneur uh, assembles a team, uh, starts uh, contacting users, works with them, builds his first MVP, the minimum viable product, so that suffice, that's response, that's just the basic functionality needed for his service to be proven. And even often, there isn't even um, a digital service at, 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 at that time. It can be full concierge mode. So you just call and do the things yourself by hand just to check if it's, it's worth uh, constructing. Um, because uh, I saw, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was uh, mid, uh, data driven, impact driven, um, but there's also a, a certain value of, of being beholden uh, to the taxpayers because the money that is spent in, in this case, in the incubator is taxpayer money. And we don't want uh, to continue building something that will just cost money because that would also be our money. So we want the money spent to be well spent. Uh, so the service has to be efficient. And we also want to make a positive net difference. It just must be another service more that will just be another obstacle on some other point. It must really have some value for the end users. After a first period of construction, if the team can prove it has an impact, uh, there can be successful uh, successive periods of six months uh, where we go before the investment strategy committee, where it's decided if there we go or we go further or not. And in Italy, in the end, uh, while your service has grown so large, it can be deployed to the whole of the nation and it can be integrated. It can be integrated in the original administration that pushed for it, or it can become a fully autonomous um, uh, organization. A lot of different things may happen. And even if even if the issue is not as happy and it doesn't, you don't succeed in, in attaining your objectives, well, there are always, always the lessons learned. Uh, there's a post-mortem about what were the failings of the project and uh, what, uh, and there was always things you have learned, people you have met, and because you, you built uh, your software in open source, there is something that can be reused for other things. And often other teams uh, and other projects and investigations starts uh, on the remains of previous investigations. The community of Betagoof has uh, grown steadily um, 
uh, over over the years. Uh, it started in 2015. Uh, when, I, when I joined, there were just 300 people, and now there are over 500. There are 80 digital services that are being deployed uh, right now, developed. Um, of every service is uh, completely transparent in its objective and results. Open statistics are fully available. There are multiple uh, success stories. Um, some of them have become autonomous uh, organizations. Uh, some of them provide a crazy service like demutualizing any administrative process in a few minutes. Others are simulators for uh, parliamentarians to estimate the impact of new law amendments before voting them uh, by changing brackets and viewing the impact on different populations. Um, the incubator has also its own network because other administration starts to copy the initiative. There are about nine at the moment and more being created. And internationally, um, you have you have Germany, uh, Canada, uh, United States, uh, um, United Kingdom and Singapore who also have those government run uh, organization who internalize and, and learn innovation from the inside. So you don't have to depend on companies who may not share uh, your services culture or long term objectives. And so what worked in regard to beta? Well, um, innovation can be organized and accelerated. Um, in the case of the incubator, but you need to problem, you need your team and you need a sponsor behind you. And the basic concepts, the formula for innovation, can be transcribed in other administrations. And when you do that, the people with which you work, they are happy, they are motivated and productive. Because when they're put in a situation where they have a meaningful impact, uh, there, there's a lot that's going on. And I, rec I recommend uh, a, a book on the uh, bullshit jobs because David Grubler talks about the happiness there is in having an impact around you. And, well, um, those formula, uh, can, can we reuse them uh, in a problem of our own, for example? And, and I went on to discover that uh, with uh, a non-profit uh, Open Justice um, here in Belgium. And the road to Open Justice was this. Um, there's an article in our constitution that says that any judgment has to be made public in accordance with the terms set by the law. But uh, that's not an old, an old article. But uh, at the moment, actually, um, while the case the case law is produced mostly by uh, the lower courts. The publication is the complete reverse. If you look for a case law online, you will mostly find uh, decisions from the upper courts. And less than 1% of the decisions are actually published. And the message we had as a population, but we received from the media, wasn't very glorious. Um, and our own history, of course, you know it, uh, of digital transformation of justice had its own fair share of issues. And so there I was uh, with my experience and um, of open source developments and seeing uh, these 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 things going on. Um, and I said, well, 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 maybe maybe we should maybe try to develop something in open source, and maybe that could inspire or like go at least progress on the issue. And without realizing it, realizing it, I discovered a good problem. A good problem because it's a real problem. It's worthwhile. It's worth to spend time on developing because uh, there will be a real achievement if we, if we do it. Uh, it's timely because uh, it's, it's, it's the right moment to work on it right now. It's also a problem that unites people. That was a great um, uh, discovery because a lot of people were interested in working on, on, this, on this solution. And it's effectively a problem. I can do something about it. And other people can do something about it. Because what do I know if, if not uh, building uh, digital services? And so what we applied? Well, we applied um, the basic, the basic uh, best practices. Uh, there were people joining the initiative. So we had a team. We collaborated around the project. We did a lot of communication about what we did. Uh, we started small experiments. Uh, we iterated on it. We developed it. Uh, before, we were, of course, fully autonomous because we were an autonomous uh, uh, nonprofit association. There was a lot of user centricity because there was a lot of users within the community which could directly ask and tell them, what's your use and how would you use it and what can you do? We shared a lot of what we do and we tried as much possible to connect with other uh, associations um, and see what they've done and how we could how they could help us, how we could help them. And after six months of uh, applying these methodologies uh, completely in our free time, we are at our second MVP iteration. And so right now we have the complete solution to upload a digital decision, scan or share it, anonymize it and pseudonymize it, pseudonymize it. We have a complete and documented API. And that API is used by one of our, of our search engine that offers a 30, 60 degree view of the Belgian case law, because it's not only the decisions we collected, but also the decisions published by the justice, by the Council of State, by the Constitutional Court. Constitutional Court. And all of that, of course, is fully in open source. 
as a community, we also set up our own uh, rituals and spaces. And that has been another uh, interesting part of, of our journey in that, in that people started testing and experimenting and discovering new digital services and that allowed them to be more effective in communicating and collaborating uh, digitally. And uh, we shared news, we shared opinions, contacts, all the while building organ and organizing uh, a whole new entity. And we had uh, our uh, B monthly meetup and other rituals. Uh, like I said, we had workshops, uh, we made goodies, we had a lot of fun. Uh, we had also had post up, post it uh, workshops, uh, which did not only were used to decorate our walls, but they provided real insights about the, the things we were trying to develop. We are developing actually. Uh, and of course, there's our GitHub page. Um, what we also did. Uh, was uh, that's what well, was maybe the most important of what we did is it, spreading the word, um, because uh, it doesn't look like much, but uh, by bit by bit it kept on increasing. And at one point, um, there was this uh, law professor from the University of Brussels, who said on LinkedIn she would provide her law course, uh, she would publish it in open access on the internet, and her reason uh, was one of the articles we published, and that was that was one. What, that was the moment I realized that, like them, we were starting to have an impact. We are, we are trying, we are, we are affecting some change. And that was really uh, um, a wake up call um, for me in the end. Uh, because in the end, it's it's all about the people. Um, it's all about the people. And if, you, if you're interested in open justice, you, you, you're easy to find. Um, because there's this feeling we, we're going to make it through a, a coming digital transformation and revolution, really. And it's all about people and ideas. And, and the best I can hope for open justice, the best I can hope for open knowledge, Belgium and other uh, initiatives is to become beacons uh, for a more efficient and respectful way forward uh, and use the jump, the cultural shift to make uh, society more accessible, more equal, uh, more enjoyable for everyone respectful, in respectful and meaningful ways. And, and that's what it's all about, in fact. Um, and to conclude uh, the open, oh, the, this last part, what worked for open justice is uh, we found a clearly identified problem. We gathered a community around it. We went. We were open. Spread the word. We applied open digital cultural, uh, open digital culture practices, and we realized that when you realized that when you create a space for privateers, privateers will come to you. And to conclude this this whole talk, uh, I want to end with these three points. Um, it's that because I'm I'm, I'm just over time. Um, an unplanned approach to innovation works sometimes. But plant innovation is a real accelerator for the digital transformation, even within the public sector. And it's ineffective in an economic and an, uh, all the while being respectful to people and motivating uh, them a uh, way of doing things. And believe me, you, with the experience I have, you, you really want to work with people who respect each other and who are motivated by what they do and by what they are allowed uh, to achieve. So uh, thank you very much for your interest and attention. Uh, thanks again to everyone for helping me, listening me through it. Um, and I think I'm just in time for the questions and free talk uh, part. Um, I also must note that uh, in the shared notes, I've put some links to uh, some of the institute and some of the things I talked about. Um, there are links to the Council of State to, uh, to 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 contact me because if you don't have time to ask a question, you always uh, shoot a mail. I'll be glad to respond. Um, there are already a few questions in the chat, the, Pitrian. Okay, I will go through them. Um, oh, what is the two-way services part? Well. The Council of State had is, is used to providing, uh, like I built most of those, uh, some of those two, just a publication service. Like, okay, we, we publish our uh, doctrine, but it's just one way. Uh, the users, uh, we, we don't uh, care for the users to come and look at, and most, most of the time we don't realize people are looking at our, our public publications. While in two way, there's a real interaction. People publish stuff, and you have to, uh, there, there, there's this movement. And, um, and suddenly, um, well, like, there are services internally from the Council of State. You have like a couple of developers for a service for 500 people that works, but you can't have one developer for a service for the whole population of Belgium. You see, because there's a two-way service. You can, if it's a one-way service, like I have my own service that, that has 15,000 views per month, but it's one way. Uh, it can be 100,000 or just 10. It won't change anything for me. But if it's a two-way service, that changes a lot, of course. Um, how do you recruit, involve end users and sector public agents? Um, well, that's 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 one of the problems. Um, the understaffing for day to day. Um, 
what what we went uh what the use the 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 not necessarily um from within the, the public sector but uh like i worked in a, a problem for for uh, users with a handicap and these users users uh we made like uh, we organized an open lab where we we put all the stakeholders together uh the different organizations um the users themselves the persons themselves and yeah, you, we just we just uh, fix uh, an open lab, for example, and that's maybe that's that's the answer to your question. Uh, there's just open lab, open lab where we reunite, reunite everyone, and so we block the day to to have uh, talks around tables. And um, when you put uh, the different st uh, stakeholders around a, a, a single table, you can you realize that there's a lot of things going on because people talk about their lived experience and suddenly there's someone just across them who can tell them oh yeah but that's because of that and sometimes there's someone from another organization under administration that says no no you misunderstand you have to do it because of this and then you realize there's a lot of miscomprehensions and then you start also to 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 see with the people present how a new service could help everyone um, move forward but you're right um, you, you can't really uh, rely uh, full time on on uh, public agents uh, people of civil servants and that's why uh, for beta group in, in uh, already is it's when when you're an entrepreneur you're detached full time you don't remain partly in your administration or to the or in the incubator if you go full time in the incubator for a couple of months um, Belgian universities are funded to do this innovation. Uh, well, they, they also do in France. Uh, what what not, if you if you do if you keep the innovation within the universities, you're, it's very too much far away. You won't have the very pragmatic and 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 um, and and it's, it can be it, it can be interesting, but. We we really concentrate on uh, for services in production. Like uh, what I did for for the Caisse des Depots uh, was one of my projects. Um, after just a couple of months, of, of a couple of weeks, we had the service in production, and we had we were part of a larger initiative, and we were like the, the front line because we were like months before anyone else because we we were that much faster and really concentrated uh, with this uh, startup way of thinking of, of providing a real service. So we started small and grew and grew and grew. And if you are, um, if you would have been completely, completely separated from the Caisse de Depot, for example, there wouldn't have been enough exchange between each other. And another thing you, you, you don't have, you shouldn't miss about that is that um, if people are kept close together, um, you also provoke a kind of cultural, cultural shift, uh, because uh, like one of, one of the things I had in the Caisse de Depot was I was we were working on the all on the same floor. Um, and some people were just completely taken aback by how much fun we had while while constructing our service because we we, we were a, a very effective team for in the, for the beginning but but we were um, we were working in full autonomy on our own service we could take up the phone and call any we want anyone we wanted we could contact the users and when we saw uh, all the subscriptions coming in all the people all the people following us and um all, all the all the great returns we had and very very motivated people uh, because the people finally felt like they could help build something but you also have to consider that suddenly uh, the citizens had someone who listened to them and that's what's incredibly, incredibly transforming for them for them and so there's also this cultural shift that happens when you mix uh, people privateers and sailors they, they see like oh can, can you have so much fun developing a service in the public sector well yes you can have and it's a ex Extraordinarily revelating for uh, the citizens and for the people building the service. Um, I also suggest that if Marina wants to comment, that uh, yes. you can speak up. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please do. Yes. So I'm French. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm, the thing is that in Belgium, uh, the governments uh, ask uh, universities to make studies to. To, to to test scenarios to to to, to create te uh, technology but not only or to, to propose new scenarios for the society with a big s to 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 go ahead and I, I think it's not really the case in France or maybe much less um and from I was I was part of the really startup uh, movement in Brussels uh, several years ago and I really saw that, uh, whenever you wanted to go into in innovation, if you I didn't have uh, uh, I didn't had a, a university partner, then this was not uh, you couldn't access grants, you couldn't access uh, really uh, being recognized, and um, and uh, innovators or 
any any regional um, subsidies would push you to, to to collaborate with universities. That's my only well, point. And I know also that in France it's the like the, they won't do the a startup nation stuff. So that's oh yeah, that, that, that's important because, because um, yeah, yeah, startup nation came after Petagoof. So okay. yeah, there's there's this there's, there's just uh, this discussion in Petagoof. Should we still keep the startup moniker because it's it's quite deserving because it's not really what was behind. Uh, um, Petagoof doesn't want anyone to be an entrepreneur or or, um, or, or even and uh, it's what important is what you say is Petagoof is only one part of uh, the digital transformation uh, uh, shift. Um, there's also Etalab, we had, which has is uh, Entrepreneur d'Intérêt Général. That's another approach. And I do think they have a lot of think tanks, uh, which do like uh, what we do here with universities. Um, it's also important to know that uh, well, it's, uh, to, to have innovation from, from, from within is also very important because you, you empower the people. One of the aspects of Etagouf is to have people from, from, from the uh, public services to be empowered and to, to grow new, new, new competencies, to, uh, to, to, to grow, in fact, in what they can achieve. They, they break out of their silo and they work with other people and they realize, okay, that is how you build new things. So it's not only just the part of building a new service, it's also like, um, uh, opening up uh, horizons and 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 letting people uh, grow and empower them to 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 affect more change. Uh, but you're right about universities. Uh, Open Justice has 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 uh, multiple uh, links to, to to other universities. That's what I realized also. Those you have, but the 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 core values, the core seeds of the approach, which are uh, user centricity, uh, impact uh, driven, uh, and such to, to to build your service uh, as with without the much fat as possible uh, those can be transplanted they can and they can, uh, within uh, another structure and they can grow there uh, they have you have the basic tools to to reinvent and to 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 uh, to appropriate those those different uh, aspects uh, from within wh whatever the the, the 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 organization is because i also know in belgium for example the a lot of it is now done by by uh, state nonprofits uh, because the, the the framework for it people is so non adapted within the, the the public sector that is, you have to create a whole new industry based on nonprofits so he, he, they could recruit and attract uh, the necessary people. But what I've lived with Betagoof is that when you create a people, when you create a space for innovation, innovative people will come to you. And that's that's if the public service wants to have uh, people uh, with ideas or want to enable his people to have ideas, that's that's one 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 way to do things. That's clearly works. Um, an open lab, oh, yeah, an open lab. Um, well, there are a lot of like words we use. Uh, an open lab is really when um, a, a state startup uh, has uh, like uh, its uh, multi-day uh, um, events uh, with uh, with different stakeholders from all over the the, the place, um, from all over the country too, because France is very big. Uh, and uh, so you go to multiple places and you have an open lab with local actors and you reunite users, you reunite people from, from the public sector and you're there also and you'll try to, to think and have their, have their experience and maybe think of solutions to their problems and obstacles uh, with them and go construct the future solution. Then that, that's an, an open, that's what the open, open lab is. Um, there is also a question on how would you advise to evangelize an administration from the inside to move in that direction that's a good question uh, i didn't uh, show it but there's actually um Betagov itself started with uh, um, a book uh, from a think tank in which they detailed their approach um, um and they, they they that's that's they were even that's that was written co-written by uh, henri verdier who is uh, at this moment the um, uh, digital ambassador for for france uh, so he, he is like the, the first evangelizer of this method. And um, uh, through this, I think now he even is one, one entrepreneur because he started um, within uh, his, he has started a new startup it's called against disinformation. So he, he was the evangelist, but now he's also an entrepreneur. Um, well, you have you got to have uh, motivated people, and you have to have motivated people at the top because if you know you're not supported by the top uh, management, so yeah, there must be somewhere an administration willing to take the steps. There are there are some some initiatives uh, in Belgium that wanted to um, 
to work with a more um, uh, startup inspired way of working. Um, there, there was, I think, like the, the catch plan in Charleroi uh, used some, some method, but not completely. Um, and it was not, not the whole same thing because uh, here we really concentrate on building uh, real services, uh, not only on, on just uh, piloting others. Um, Oh, I see an interesting question. Sorry. Um, so, if, uh, if if you want to know more about about evangelization, evangelization, uh, feel free to write me a mail. I'll, I'll I'll put the documentation forward and maybe have a discussion about that. Um, I'm very enthusiastic. Yes, <laughs> because I live by this. I live by this. Have you had experience with your products clashing with legacy systems and related budgets? Well. Um, BetaGoof has uh, internal formations, courses uh, for people. And one of the courses is how to survive in a hostile environment. Environment, Because as you are completely autonomous, uh, you go forward, you, you are going to step on other people's toes. That's guaranteed. Uh, the state is, is a very pyramidical environment. And in fact, the, 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 the incubator itself allows completely horizontal teams to exist within a completely pyramidical structure. And it helps for Betagoof to be a service from the prime minister because you just can take up the phone and say, hello, I call you from uh, the office of the prime minister and, and every door will open for you. But if Betagoof was just a region, original uh, office, it couldn't do anything of what it has done. Um, so you have to have a, a sponge script from high, 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 way up high. Um, uh, products clashing, what, what my, my experience is there's, al there's always a solution. Um, like. I, I have my experience at Caisse de Depot, which, Caisse de Depot, which is a humongous administration. I think its budget is close to the Belgian uh, gross national product. Um, it's, it's, it's completely uh, dimension, uh, incredible. And they have a very uh, specific and re it's extremely well organized. And I had the chance to be in the first uh, Startup Data initiative from the Caisse de Depot. And so we clashed a lot. It was a very uh, learning experience, both for us and for them. Because we we came with new questions uh, because uh, they were they were like uh, lit legacy protocols and ways of doing things and we just went right through them. It was inconceivable for them to have a production team for a development team of even more before that a research and development team. But that's how they defined us. Um, it was inconceivable for them to have such a team um, have a public IP and publish a full. Uh, production service without any kind of control in between. And so we had to open that accesses because, and they, we could force this opening of accesses because we were supported way up high by uh, the hierarchy within uh, the case of the pool. So you had to have, you got to have the right sponsors to open up uh, and, to, and to go through uh, legacy uh, objections. Uh, and there's always, always a way through. Uh, I hope so. You you, you can you can also uh, encounter difficulties, and and that's 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 one. Uh, there are startups who who, who fail to to go through the, the, these uh, these uh, objections, and that's one of the reasons why your, your initiative can, can cannot cannot uh, cannot end successfully. Uh, does link data? Um, I don't know of link data, but I know that uh, one of the first ideas of Betagoof, uh, we're talking a lot about Betagoof, but that's because uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting, I think. Um, it started from uh, Datagoof, because Datagoof is that open data platform for the Belgian state. And it was like a question like, how do we make the best use of this open data? Um, well, maybe we should try test new kind of services. And from that first idea grew the, the incubator idea. Let's, oh yes, let's, and as an incubator, we make a lot of use of, of uh, public data. Um, we make a lot of use of, of uh, open source uh, developed by other teams because um, each team in France, every every service, every software written is open sourced. So each team is fully open sourced. And uh, what happens a lot is uh, when you work on a problem, you go see what others have done, and then you start building upon what they have did. And that's really interesting because, like, if if you if you build um, a job matching tool, you have the market, you have a uh, person looking for a job, and you build a first job matching uh, algorithm um, because you're the first one. When you're the second one, you go look around and you realize, oh, there's someone else who built a job matching algorithm. You know it. And so we can take what they built and improve on it. And after a couple of teams, you end up with a very, very good uh, job matching algorithm instead of having tens or hundreds of 
completely mediocre job matching algorithm. You have something that grew over time, and that's the basic uh, uh, tenet of, of open source. And that's what that's what that's that's what it's a big value for for um, for for a beta group is to have every, everything uh, full, fully open sourced, uh, and the data also. Um, I don't know if there's other other questions because we are already a bit past time. Uh, if you can also speak up um, if you're connected to the audio. Uh, public hubs, yes. Uh, and there's some chat going on. Another another difficulties um, at the end of uh, of. Uh, uh, where you build your MVP, but then there's also a transfer period where you have to adapt. Okay, you tested, you proved that uh, your 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 project, your your idea for new service works. Then you also have to uh, give it over to the administration where it has to be integrated by um, the, the IT service. And so there's also that that must also be taken into account. Um, well, uh, no problem. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's, it's the less I can do, really. Um, I, I try to. I, I don't always think I have that much interesting things to to to, to talk about. But when Astrid invited me, I thought, well, well maybe yeah, there was one or two things I could talk about. And finally, I ended up with a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of things. Uh, mitigate risk staking. That's very interesting. Um, there's a gradual risk increase. Um, Better go work together with. Uh, I don't know exactly what uh, the, the. It's not state security, but it's close to uh, something of an official uh, security organism within France, and like um, the. At first, there's the, not not much risk because there's not much users, and in fact, the risk increase with the number of users you have, and so you can start your service like having a very. Uh, few uh, rules about security or of data protection because there's almost no data and the constraints grow over time so you don't have to build from the beginning a completely secure solution because you will end up your six months with nothing built um, and you can also use a lot of no code tools just to go forward because everyone isn't a developer and sometimes you don't even need a developer if it's just a form you want you want you want to push around um, and so the, the security considerations and risks grow with the application. And at one point, you're going to need uh, developers. You're going to need people experienced uh, building uh, building stuff. Um, and that's one difference between um, EIG from Etalab and Betagoof is that Betagoof uh, mostly relies on mostly relies on experienced developers because we build services and they must be autonomous and uh, they must grow and be as fast in production as possible. So there's no real uh, time for to to learn uh, on 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 the job, while EIG is more like um, attracting new talents to the public sector. That is, it's really uh, different approaches, but to the same problem. It's to work and make make the culture shift and attract new 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 pub, new uh, profiles to the to the public sector and work on pl problems of public policies because those those problems have a lot of impact and can affect a lot of change and can better and can really better uh, people's lives. So, anyways, if there's any other question you you, you want, uh, you you can ask. Uh, you can always uh, send me a mail, and I'll be happy to reply. Is it okay if I uh, end the recording now, Petrian? Okay. So, oh, it was still recording. I didn't realize. Yes, it was still yeah, recording. Sure. Uh, thanks again to Astrid. Uh, thank you to the Open Justice.